All right, Buena Seta, fresh off the streets of Queens. You already know what it is. It's your boy, Big Rich. Long day. You know what they say about work, right? If it didn't work, how can you enjoy, you know what I'm saying, the downtime? You know what I'm saying? That's what my dad used to say. You should cherish work. I don't know about all that, but. All right, salute and good evening. I'm very excited. As you see the banner on the screen, Mob Story Season 2 has begun, and I told you we're going to do things a little bit different, all right? I'm going to talk to Shattered. Definitely going to do at least one live show at night. I mean, I'm not sure when. Strictly dedicated to the Mob Stories, all right? Maybe we do a live story, have you know people call in, whatever. But we'll go live. You know, Maybe we'll do a roundup of the week's articles and go live and talk about the week's articles. Who knows? But I'm excited. So uh, either today or tonight, you'll see a new playlist being created, Mob Story Season 2. And, uh, you know, like I said, continuing what we created, right? New banner, salute to Vic Vega. Salute to Shattered. You know the team. You already know. I mean, I don't want to say it every day. It's We're a fucking team. That's all I can say. Of course, tonight's episode is sponsored by Justice Tech Pro. Salute to Dominic and everybody over there. Real excited, real excited. So being that this is, you know, I think this is the month for all articles affiliated with Irishman. Let's, you know, we're going to we're gonna get down to Angelo Bruno and all the other characters. And, and this way, you know, we just have a, you know, a beautiful understanding of the story behind the story. And sometimes the story behind the story is the real story. Before we begin, gentlemen, wipe your feet on the rug. Throw some smoke in the atmosphere. You know how we do. Got the last of the OG Kush mixed with a little bit of live resin. And what can I say? It's delicious. Of course, let me know in the comments what you are. What you're smoking on tonight. And don't forget, when you subscribe to this channel, make sure you press the bell. And when you press the bell, make sure it says all notifications. That means the bell should have two lines around it, like parentheses, on the left side of the bell and the right side of the bell. That means you'll get all the notifications. This is very important. Make sure your bell is pressed so you have the lines around the bell to receive all notifications, okay? Let's get right into business. Of course, again, salute to Justice Tech Pros. Please go check them out. They're doing something really great over there. And I want to see, see his platform grow. He deserves it, all right? The real-life Philadelphia gangsters who inspired the Irishman. And, of course, on the screen you see Skinny Joey Merlino. The recent release of Martin Scorsese's movie, The Irishman, has brought new attention to the cabal that has been organized crime's most famous manifestation in the United States. The Italian-American mafia, La Cosa Nostra, a.k.a. This Thing of Ours. A fair amount of action of the Irishman centers on and around Philadelphia, where the hitman lead character Frank Sheeran, played by Robert De Niro, purportedly did most of his work. The movie has drawn some new attention to downtown, what South Philadelphia was and still often is called by anyone who lives there, and some of the Philadelphia's most famous or infamous organized crime figures of the past, including Felix Skinny Razor Di Tullio, which we're going to do a, 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 you know, a spotlight on him, played by Bobby Cannavale, uh, Bobby Cannavale from, uh, um, of course, Boardwalk Empire. Angelo, the gentle Don Bruno, played by the one and only Harvey Keitel. And Philip Chicken Man Testa, played by Larry Romano. We're going to put spotlights on all of them. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We have to. I, the author used to work in South Philly. Uh, he was just a kid fresh out of grad school, and the neighborhood was, well, it was something. It was the late 1990s in downtown with Posse Yonk Avenue as the aortic valve that fed the whole area its vitality. Had gone through a brutal mob war between a young born and bred wise guy, Joe, Joseph Skinny Joey Merlino, and the local mob boss, the Sicilian John Stanford. On February 20, 2018, Judge Richard Sullivan, whom President Trump has since promoted to federal circuit, declared a mistrial in Mr. Merlino's case. After deliberation had begun, several days before, the jury had told the judge four times that they were impossibly deadlocked and unable to reach a verdict on any of four counts against Mr. Molino. 
Each time Judge Sullivan had asked them to continue deliberating, Mr. Sullivan finally gave the jury an Allen charge, exhorting them to try to reach a consensus and then relented and declared a mistrial. In the aftermath, Mr. Molino accepted a plea deal where he would serve time on gambling charges. He did a fairly easy year and a half in prison and is now back on the streets. Once upon a time, Mr. Molino was known as the John Gotti of Pasiunk Avenue for his debonair appearance in his public blagadocio. His criminal record before his most recent trial included convictions for aggravated assault, possession of a weapon for unlawful purposes, robbing an armored car, and various racketeering charges. The 2001 conviction resulted in a 14-year prison sentence. Because Mr. Molino is from Philadelphia and, w and is residing in Florida at the time of his most recent arrest, the connection with the Southern District of New York was tenuous, and press coverage and public interest was fairly muted. With the exception of closing arguments and uh, expected verdict, the viewing gallery usually only held half a dozen viewers each day, largely local reporters and occasionally family members and friends of Mr. Molino. I got some Manson lamps from some of Mr. Molino's crew on one occasion, and a few of the guys bummed gum off of me on another, but Skinny Joey's associates more or less just coexisted with the reporters. Court can be boring. There are long hours where you wait for the jury, wait for the judge, or watch lawyers whispering in a sidebar, and you end up chatting with each other. Even if one of you is an editor at a Catholic periodical, the other one has been charged with murder. Mr. Molino's trial followed his arrest along with 45 other alleged members of an East Cosa Nostra empire on various criminal charges in August of 2016. After it became clear that the government evidence was tainted by FBI misconduct and dubious behavior by cooperating witnesses, including erasing evidence from wiretaps, domestic violence charges, and alleged robbery committed while working for the FBI, the government, often, the government offered vastly reduced sentences on plea bargains to the defendants. Of the 46, only Mr. Molino and one other defendant refused deals. Press reports suggested Mr. Molino, who had famously never accepted a plea bargain during a lifetime of criminal prosecutions, had turned down a deal where he would plead guilty to reduce charges and serve one to three years in jail. In court, Mr. Molino's lead lawyer, Edwin Jacobs, hammered government witnesses for inconsistencies in testimony and for their own criminal backgrounds, including the star witness, J.R. Rubio. Mr. Rubio, who spent numerous months with Mr. Molino in Florida while wearing an FBI wire to detail his criminal activities, disgraciate, stated under oath his reason for testifying against Mr. Molino was a desire to avoid prison time. He was jailed anyway for various alleged crimes committed while he was an FBI informant. Even the prosecution conceded in its closing argument that jurors might consider Mr. Rubio someone who personally who personal failings are immense. Mr. Rubio also testified that the FBI had given him $25,000 to lure Mr. Molino to a meeting at an Arthur Avenue restaurant in the Bronx where Mr. Molino could be secretly taped, Disgraciate. providing the basis for a criminal conspiracy charge that could be prosecuted in New York. Mr. Jacobs chose not to present a defense case relying on the testimony of the government's witness and his own cross-examinations. The trial lasted less than three weeks after an initial delay because Mr. Molino was, was hospitalized in Florida for heart trouble. Pressed for comment after the declaration of mistrial, Skinny Joey had only one thing to say, God bless the jury. Mr. Molino's prominent public figure in Philadelphia before his long prison sentence and his alleged return to crime since his release have reportedly once again made him a prime target of the FBI. Investigations in his hometown and a future indictment in Philadelphia is rumored to be in the works. That is all hearsay. There's no proof that he has returned to a life of crime. There is no proof of that whatsoever. That is hearsay, all right? So we will have to, uh, you know, say that. Sorry about that. But we have to add that there. There's no proof of that. And rumored to be in the works is rumors. We're not going to spread rumors. 
The nicknames of Mr. Molino's alleged associates mentioning mentioned over the years in government documents are straight out of central casting. Beeps, Horsehead, Snitch, Scoops, Chicky, Mousy, Penknife, Windows, Handsome Steve, Baby Dom, Uncle Joe, and many more. But those are all for neighborhood nicknames, say locals. Mr. Molino's nickname was supposedly coined in childhood to distinguish him from a similarly named but huskier relative, Fat Joey. The neighborhoods of South Philly, a stronghold of Italian-American culture, for over a century have always been a place where law enforcement and neighborhood customs have easily coexisted. Local lotteries, the numbers, sports betting, card games, loan sharking, video poker machines, and various other enterprises still exist today in South Philadelphia in a quasi-public way and have landed almost all of the above-named characters in trouble with the law. And there is no question that local residents long adored the presence of dyed-in-the-wool gangsters like the notoriously and like the notorious and recently de- like the notorious and recently deceased Nicodemo Little Nicky Scarfo and his associates, including Mr. Merlino's father and uncle. The former died in prison in 2012, and the later became a government witness and lived out the rest of his life in the federal witness program. Disgracia. A long-time alleged boss of the Philadelphia Atlantic City organized crime family, Angelo the Gentle Don Bruno, who was played by Harvey Cartel, was murdered by unknown, well, more or less, assailants in 1980 after decades as the presumed chief of South Philadelphia's criminal rackets. Mr. Bruno's alleged successor and Mr. Scarfo's predecessor in the Philadelphia mob, Philip Chickaman Testa, was killed by rivals in a brazen South Philly porch bomb attack later in 1981, designed to look like the work of Irish-American mobsters from Philadelphia. Northeast neighborhoods. According to the arcane rules of the American underworld, Italian American gangsters do not use bombs to kill someone. Irish American gangsters do. The murder earned mention from Bruce Springsteen in the first stanza of the 1982 song, which does not appear in the soundtrack of the Irishman in Atlantic City. Well, they blew up the chicken man in Philly last night, they blew up his house too. Down on the boardwalk, they're getting ready for a fight. I'm going to see what them racket boys do. Bars. The suspected killers of the chicken man were all murdered in the ensuing years, repeatedly on the orders of Mr. Testa's son, Salvatore Testa, a charismatic alleged gangster who had been profiled in the Wall Street Journal as a rising star in the other world. He also allegedly sold a rundown bar in Atlantic City to Donald J. Trump so that a casino could be built on the property. The younger Testa was himself later killed in a gangland hit because of fears from Mr. Scarfo that he would take over Philadelphia's criminal rackets, a crime for which Mr. Scarfo was convicted as part of a wide-ranging indictment in 1989. Within a few years of Mr. Scarfo's imprisonment, Joey Merlino was identified by the FBI as the unofficial head of the Philadelphia mob. When a television reporter asked Mr. Molino about rumors that the incarcerated Mr. Scarfo had put a $500,000 bounty on his head, he smiled and quipped, give me the half a million and I'll shoot myself. Mr. Molino was later wounded in a drive-by shooting with apparent rivals on a South Philadelphia street corner in 1993, an incident with his close friend Michael Mikey Chang Caglini was killed. But is South Philadelphia in 2019 the South Philadelphia of 1993 or of 1983? Is the violence and vengeance portrayed in the Irishman indicative of the lives of downtown's legendary wise guys? And is Mr. Molino truly still a gangster or just a gambler who happens to enunciate the vowels at the end of his name? Mr. Jacobs has argued in previous court cases that 1980-style racketeering in South Philly is largely defunct and that Mr. Molino and his associates are hardly the violent criminals that are made out to be in government prosecutions. Philadelphia's violence and corruption are more likely to come these days from Russian, Chinese, and African-American organized crime groups, as well as from the drug world. George Anastasia, a former Philadelphia Inquirer reporter, who has covered Philadelphia's organized crime beat for decades, has frequently made another point in print. 
Many of the traditional criminal enterprise with which Mr. Molino and his South Philly associates have been charged over the years now have their counterparts in the legitimate world. The local number rackets compete with the state lottery, which offers a daily payout little different from the neighborhood enterprise. Sport bettors can legally place wagers in Atlantic City or Las Vegas. Fans of Game and Chance can legally gamble at the Sugar House Casino in Philadelphia or at various the locals, even loan sharking with its notoriously high interest payments, has its legal counterpart in the payday loan operation found everywhere in South Philly, all charging extortionate interest. See, so as long as the government can do it, it's legal. Why then does the government continue to pursue Mr. Molino and his associates? I think it, I think it's a little more complicated than just a question of, of what the government thinks Joey might have done. Mr. Anastasia cautioned in a phone interview with America in 2018 during Mr. Molino's most recent trial in a quote that would have come straight out of the Irishman. Quote, this is what Mr. Anastasia said. Yes, I think Joey was targeted in his indictment because he's Joey, not because of anything he did. On the other hand, this is where the feds are coming from. They have five, six unsolved deaths in the past in Philadelphia that they think these guys are responsible for. A lot of these FBI guys believe that Joey and his friends literally got away with murder. Again, allegedly, they have no proof. Great, great article. Mob Story Season 2. Thank you for listening. I know it was a long, a kind of a long video. But uh, again, great article. You, can, you know, um, breaks it down even more. And we'll break it down more every night. We're going to break it down more. Let's have fun with this. Again, salute to Justice Tech Pros for sponsoring tonight's show. Remember, Mob Story Season 2 has begun. We will change it up. We will figure it out. And we are going to start doing these mob stories live. That's how we're going to change it up. Do it live. People come in, come in. You want to get in on the live shows. When we go live with the mob stories, you need to make sure that the bell is pressed. And it says all alerts. When it's pressed for all alerts, you're going to have a line on each side of the bell. All right? Salute to everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you for listening. Like, comment, share. Let me know what you're smoking on, gentlemen. Have a great one. We will talk tomorrow morning for Waking Up with Ruckus. Salute.